Okay, Lewis, we are live on Facebook. So uh, thanks everybody for being willing to, to join us tonight for Imago Voices Live. Uh, we're doing this as a part of our series on the Lord's Prayer. And so typically for those of you who aren't familiar with Imago Voices, our Imago Voices are usually written material that people do based on the sermon series that we're in. Um, but because uh, we're not able to really see and interact with each other, we thought maybe it'd be better for us to do live versions of people just sharing their stories and their thoughts and their experiences. So um, tonight we're going to be speaking with Lewis Ingersoll and Lewis has a rich a history and story that um, I think a lot of us will have moments of shock and moments of laughter and moments of excitement uh, because I know that was my experience the first time that um, I began to hear some of the things that um, Lewis has experienced in his life. So um, today we're going to be focusing on what we talked about in the sermon on last Sunday, which was this idea of temptation or testings or trials, um, of the, how that part of the prayer can be translated differently uh, and being delivered from evil and um, what that looks like. Evil with inside ourselves, evil that exists around us and, and how that manifests in the world and Lewis's experiences with it. So Lewis, thanks for being willing to, to share today and be on the, the live, uh, whatever this is called, Mago Voices Live <laughs> with mm -hmm. us. What has quarantine been like for you? Oh, it's been a change of pace, and uh, it, it's it's taken some time to get used to it. But I think, boy, we're getting getting acclimated to it. But we're also looking forward to it being over. Uh, but it's it's given me time to do a lot more reading than I was doing before, and so I've been doing a lot of history, both uh, American history and then also uh, church history period from uh, a couple hundred years before the Reformation right up until now. Hmm. And um, um, I, I see the same thing in history as far as just he's, history repeating itself. And I see so many things going on today, both in the church and also in our government that have has gone on for what seems like centuries or decades and with uh, just a different group doing it. A lot of, um, I, I had never realized how much uh, uh, repetition there is in man's history. And um, it just is what it is. It's encouraging in some ways, but it's uh, depressing in other ways. Yeah, it is. And it's, it's amazing when you study church history, how much of even church history repeats itself, not just political and social history, but just people do and what people do and so much of it has to do with power grabs and an unwillingness to to hear the other side uh, of different perspectives but thinking that we've always got all the right answers right <laughs> yeah yeah so you know talking about that a little bit like how do you you know some people understand the idea of trials or temptations in scripture particularly in the lord's prayer this idea of trials as like testings for people going through persecution or a testing at the end of the age or just like diff trials and challenges that people go through right now. So there's a lot of different ideas and understandings of that. Um, but how do you personally define like what trials and temptations are? What, is, what do those words mean to you personally? I think it just means life to me. And like life is, is temptations and life is trials. And um, I, I think it... Um, as long as I can remember, uh, I've had temptations and trials, and, and temptations uh, include just a whole spectrum of things. And I think about particularly I, one simplistic way of understanding it is trials that have to do with selfishness hmm. and how it's just, I, I had the temptations when I was three years old and selfishness, and I have them today. And uh, and then there are all these uh, things like this particular thing where we are today. Um, I, I've had actually, I think in my human experience, worse things that happen to me than this. Mm. And uh, this is just a peculiar time when it's happening to everybody. But I've had those, um, those intense emotional experiences when there were other people having them at the same time I was, but not the whole world so to speak, like we are today. That's a little bit different, but um, 
but um, I think uh, uh, I think God factors into all this when we talk about God. I I see God. Uh, the, the biggest thing is is God's presence and God is with us. God is with us whether we're in the deep temptations or light temptations or just very ordinary stuff. God's presence is just there. And um, we had doing a devotion this morning and it had a phrase in there about call or it says Holy Spirit. Uh, it says, you know, like come, come now Holy Spirit. Mm. And, I, and my reaction to that is the Holy Spirit is always there, you know, and God is always there. We don't have to call, although there are times that out of our humanness, we do, and we, our desperateness, we certainly call, call out, but um, there's no question that, you know, in our deepest sin, our temptations, our trials, uh, God is still, that God is there, and all the time. I know I, I have sensed God's presence, I know, intensely when I've been in some very extreme circumstances, and, uh, yeah. both yeah, good I and bad. Yeah, I love the, like, so at the end of the month is Pentecost. So then the 31st was celebrating the Pentecost. And I, I think, you know, sometimes we get this idea that like the Holy Spirit finally showed up on Pentecost. And before that, the Spirit wasn't at work, you know, because we, we see more conversations around the Spirit. But like the Spirit was always present, you know, that God was always with us. It's just on Pentecost, they had a greater awareness of God's presence with them in a unique way, right? And, and also it, it didn't just rest upon individuals or just, hovering over the face of the earth, but it's, it, it took residency in humans. And there's this deep awareness that we became more aware of whose image we've been created. Mm -hmm. I also think it's interesting that you, you said that, that like at three years old, you know, you had temptations. Um, I think about <laughs> when you say that, like how you have to teach a toddler to share, like their, their natural tendency is to want to just like, give me, that's mine. I don't want to give that to you. I don't want to share that with you. But you have to teach them the beauty and value of sharing. And like, that is still a temptation. You have to teach someone when they're three or when they're 30 or when they're, you know, in their eighties. Like it's, it's, uh, it's a natural tendency for people who want to go buy um, toilet paper at the store to not want to share, right? This is mine. <laughs> I need this. Um, so we all have those temptations, don't we? So you, you named about like going through difficult things for you and how it's been helpful to know, like from the time you were three till now, like that God is with you, God is there, that God's awareness has been evident for you. So what sort of temptations or trials, battles have you gone on in your life that you've, you've experienced God's presence with you in those ways? Um, well, you, you, you know, I've, I, I've, I've thought about it and I, my, when I was three years old, I, I'm aware that I was being read Bible stories out of the Old Testament. Hmm. And, and, and it just, you know, God it made sense to, to a three-year-old. It made sense to me. And, and I, I always had a softness uh, in my Christian experience. My parents were, were soft about it. It wasn't a hardcore hmm. thing. It wasn't hard. It was easy to receive. And I received, uh, you know, one of the simplest explanations of God is God is love. And I experienced that love through my parents. And then the, the people, the churches that we went to were, were softer. You know, that wasn't a harsh thing. And I didn't uh, rebel. Um, but um, the, uh, the, the times when I really intensely experienced was I was uh, in an in intensive care. And literally my life was going and I got woke up in the middle of the night and said, we're going downstairs. And I said, can't it wait till morning? And they said, uh, you've had five blood transfusions since you came in. And they you said, now you, we've just checked and you've got less blood now than when you came in here. And we've got to see if we can save your life. And um, that happened to me three times in one year. One of the times I was, well, I, they were, I was heavily transfused all three of those times like 11 pints of blood one time. Wow. And, um, but, but all through that, um, I was always conscious and I always had the, the presence of God. I was even listening to, uh, um, I was sedated, but I could still play it. At that time, it was a little cassette tape recorder and I had uh, scriptures that I could listen to. Mm -hmm. And uh, 
I, I, I found that very, you know, very comforting. And I've always just had a, an awareness of God's presence. I went through a divorce. That was probably the most difficult period in my life. And I was around 40 years old at that time hmm. and had seven kids. And um, boy, that was a tough one for me. But I still, I, you know, I, 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 it, was just, it was just tough. All I could do was hang on. And then I had many different people help me through that. And I see that that was God working through other people to help me. And I buy into the idea that we are God's hands and feet. I can, I can understand that in a simplistic kind of way. And um, Would you share a little bit more about or maybe a little bit more about what, um, what prompted the divorce, but also about your own battles with, as you shared before, I know openly with like alcoholism and what that looked like. And maybe the folks that came around you that provided support to you when you were going through those sort of temptations and trials. Well, the, the, the divorce was, uh, was prompted by my, my first wife and, um, we'd had a, we were in living in Plow Creek in a, around Tisco, Illinois, and we had been having marriage counseling for two years and it, 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 it was working. I mean, we were, and then we had the responsibility. We were working together, taking care of seven children. And then in the midst of that, after about two years of the marriage counseling, she just said, enough. I don't want to, I don't want to go on with the marriage anymore. And, uh, and then she went off in another direction, i.e. she made a, an intellectual decision that she wanted to live a lesbian lifestyle. And so that, that was a, a, another wrinkle to it, but yet it, it really didn't affect me any more than if she decided to divorce me and get together with a football coach or somebody else. It, it was, it was the, the death of a relationship and all that that implies. And then I was, I was, you know, you, in a relationship, you have a dumper and a dumpy. And I was a dumpy. And I found out where I went to the various uh, single groups that I related to women more than I did to men. And mm -hmm. they related to me because I was a dumpy. And at the age yeah. 40, there were a lot of women who were, had been dumped and I could commiserate with them and they them with me but it uh, that was a difficult thing you know I I mean I, I, I was up against scriptures and I just could not comprehend uh, d dissolving a marriage I was a fundamentalist literalist and the scriptures that were related to marriage were so emphatic and so clear I just I pleaded with the elders that we were around then to go and to make her feel guilty and to browbeat her or anything to, you know, just, uh, that was my mindset. And to let, letting go of that was, was just uh, extraordinarily pain, get painful and difficult. Now I take on a, I feel much more like Job in viewing uh, so many things that go on with us. And I begin, the beginning point is what we just can't understand what God's doing. Sure. Just can't not understand it. And I'm, I get frustrated now with the yak yak of the medical profession and then the yak yak of the business or the government. The government and the medical are not always in, in this government, not always on the same page. And truthfully, I don't, you know, they even admit they don't really know what's going on and how long. Everybody must know how long. How, well, nobody really knows anything. They really don't know. And um, I take... I take comfort in Job. I just do. I mean, Job, such an example of, of never giving up on God. Everybody around him wanted him to throw in the towel and curse God and die. And sure. he said, nope, I'm not going to do it. I'm going to, uh, I'm going to trust him even though he slay me. Yep, well, I will trust him. And, uh, yeah. and um, he didn't understand and he couldn't comprehend, but he didn't need to. And uh, I feel that way. I don't, I don't need to know. Uh, I used to be real nosy when I was in a religious cult and I wanted to know what's going on. What's this? What's that? And they'd say, brother, if God wants you to know, he'll show you. And they even, I was even told to pray and ask God to show me what's going on. Well, sometimes he would and sometimes he wouldn't, you know, it's none of my business. Some of the time. Yeah. 
So you, you talked a little bit there, uh, you tipped your hat to the religious cult that you were in, which to me is the most like fascinating part because you don't, you know, you, you don't, the idea of what a cult is, you know, is it's so subjective at times, depending on whatever the main religion is of a mainstream culture. Um, so I'm, I'm curious, like what, how did you get into a, a cult and what were the beliefs or main principles of that cult and, and why are you not in that? cult anymore what does that look like for you well the, the the cult was was a religious fundamentalist jesus part of the jesus people thing back in the late 60s and early 70s it lasted through the 70s really um and there were a lot of there were different culty type of things cults have very definite characteristics there's books written about cults Our, one i was in have, has been included in many of the recent books about cults and typically, they have an authoritarian leader, um, and uh, but 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 this one was uh, was very uh, much styled as we were we were in training to be full time missionaries, and we even where we were located originally when my wife first wife and I joined it, uh, there were 120 people and living in tents, buses, and vans. We met the group in Houston, Texas, and just I, I saw them on TV, and I, I, I used to say the story, and I'd known, oh, I had a big can of beer in one hand and a cigarette in the other hand, and I wanted to go out and see these crazies who were living in the county park. Uh, I ha we certainly were not practicing, you know, our Christian anything, and um, went out there, and somebody just walks up to you, and it's just hardcore evangelism. Somebody walks up and says to you, do you know Jesus? And, you know, I said, well, I've, you know, I've heard of him and blah, blah. But anyway, uh, the next thing I know, within 24 hours, I was I had a job for about a year and a half and was in process of buying a house. And uh, I, but in, within 24 hours, I was ready to, you know, it says no, no man can serve two masters. You know, you will love one and hold to the other or despise one. You cannot serve God in mammon. And that was the that was what you saw was you serve God, you go this way, you serve mammon, you go that way. And then a lot of other people, um, when we would go out on a witnessing on the street, it would be not unusual at all to find two or three people that would return with us to the wherever we were, were living at the time. And the group grew from 120 to almost 1,500 in a year and a half. Wow. My, my job the first six months was practically focused on plumbing things because we were living in a 400 acre uh, missionary training camp. It had, it had been that in the past. It had been abandoned for 10 years. Hmm. So there were many plumbing things to get fixed up and going. And um, I was 25 or 26 at the time. And most of the people were probably more like 18 to 20. So I was much older than most. And after six months, I started getting all kinds of responsibility, financial responsibility. And then we had all kinds of legal issues with people coming in. And I was charged with um, working with attorneys and lawyers and doing all the court cases and having all that stuff. And it was pretty consuming. We had people being deprogrammed. We would have people kidnapped from us or, Mm. and going through a de deprogramming process. And one of my jobs was to locate them and then find attorneys. You had to do a radical attorney back in those days because nobody would take cases like the religious cults, not the number one thing people are looking to represent. Sure. <laughs> so what, what, what prompted you to want to leave that cult or transition away to, to something different? And nothing more than personality conflicts with the leadership. I was, uh, when, uh, after six months, I was working right under the, the top guy, the, the authoritarian leader of the deal. And then as he went out of the country, uh, well, then we had a new group of leaders come in and we were growing very fast. And so uh, I, would, I would say a personality conflict really says it as good as anything, just in that they didn't have stuff for me to do and I'm going to be, do, be doing something or and um, and I was uh, actually was in for 
close to four years, like to three or four months in short of four years. Wow. So you, you know, you, you grew up in a family that at a pretty young age, you got to experience and understand the love of God in some way. You were married and you had seven kids. You got divorced. Um, you were in that cult with your wife, I understand. Um, and then, uh, so that, that came first. And then at what point in your story did you begin to struggle with, struggle with alcohol? Um, and, and how did that, how did that journey look for you? And, and, the, and did you road, road to recovery? Well, it, it really got intense after the period of time when I got out of the cult. There was a, just a massive uh, emotional adjustment to go through. Uh, when you've been in a cult, it's just really difficult. And I, I ha had a real estate license at the time when I got out of the cult. And so the quickest, fastest thing I could do to make money and support a family. When I got out, we was at the time my third child was born. So I had three children and my wife and I needed to make money. And, but anyway, that was when I started using alcohol as a, I was self-medicating on alcohol basically. And I was using alcohol very much like a sleep, sleep aid, hmm. but it gets to be, uh, in my case, it was harmful to my health. Mm -hmm. And I, I can't remember how long after a couple of two years, maybe, then I started having an internal bleeding and, um, and got, it got serious enough that, uh, but I never would stop. I would stop drinking for two or three weeks and prove to myself I was not an alcoholic. And then I would pick mm -hmm. up again. And, uh, um, and then I, I picked again during my divorce period of time, I used alcohol then to, um, as a sleep aid. And uh, yeah, I, I was probably what you would call a, a moderate to higher functioning alcoholic. I mm -hmm. was very much, uh, I was very secretive about it. I rarely drank before eight or nine o'clock at night. And then I drank it by myself. Usually I never drank publicly. I just did, I just didn't. I just it was very uncomfortable doing that. Yeah. But then, uh, and then I did not, I went through a long period of time where I didn't, alcohol was not a problem. And then in 2003, one of my children was having a really severe drug and out, drug problem, not alcohol, but drug problem. So I got involved in AA as, as, a, as a way of trying to help them. And then it was right away, I knew I had never quit drinking but I could not really identify or I couldn't call myself alcoholic. Mm. But, over, I used, but I started in 2003 and for the next 10 years, I went to meetings, AA meetings here in the Peoria area five times a week, at least, at least five times a week for my first 10 years. And, um, and I became convinced I, I really was an alcoholic and I, my father had been an alcoholic and my pattern was similar to his. Uh, he drank at night, not, he didn't let people know about it. And he actually got sober through AA and was sober for about six or seven years, the last years of his life, but he died at age 47. Hmm. And I was 22 at that time. But, um, but AA's, you know, a very simplistic, uh, the steps are, it's a very simplistic thing came out of, uh, uh, fundamental Christianity in 1935, and they they designed the steps or in, in, a, in a manner in, in which they were presenting uh, a spiritual solution, which was really simplistic Christianity or mm -hmm. simplistic Judaism, because they left out God. They didn't want to, or they did not want to make religion a part of it, because the typical alcoholics would recoil from a any kind of a religious solution. So they, they the big book uh, actually mentions God 259 times and mentions Jesus, I think, once. And uh, the reason is so that people don't get turned off. They, mm -hmm. that God doesn't scare people as much as Jesus. Jesus is so associated with institutional religion that people are turned off to it. Now, Interestingly, uh, when AA got started, I don't know how many first 40, 50 years, the majority of meetings were held in church buildings. Wow, yeah. 
we uh, at Amago we we have uh, we have an AA group that meets there. Uh, do, do you ever attend that that group particular? Yeah. Um, so what what is what is your journey around? Um, I know like one of the things that's so neat to me is that it, like later in your life, post retirement, you you discovered what how amazing and liberating it was to be able to like just serve people and to just pick up everything and go and help people in need. So can you share with us a little bit about some of the things you've you've been able to do to help people um, when they're going through different trials or temptations, whether that's being a sponsor or whether that's traveling to Israel, Palestine, or, um, you know, volunteering with Salvation Army. Uh, what, what ways have you, and in, in, in practically stories even that you could share? Well, you I'd say that the, the first thing is, is that it's, it's really following in the footsteps of Jesus is the idea. And, um, and it's the same thing in Alcoholics Anonymous, the, the key to sobriety is, is it, it says in the, in the big book, it says there is a solution and you have to grasp there's a solution. Well, what is the solution? The solution in AA is to have a spiritual experience. Well, what is that? Having a spiritual experience comes about as a direct result of practicing spiritual principles. Well, that's just simple New Testament stuff. That's just simple teachings of Jesus. You practice those and talk about temptations, the temptations are gone. I've discussed temptations with when, I, when I've gone to Israel and with friends here in AA. And, um, and, and, and I've, I've described how when we're, we went one time, we were in 2016, we were gone for four months to Israel. And I mean, we were busy helping people and then we were helping each other. And the whole thing was helping uh, children who needed heart surgeries and they came from all over the Middle East from, mm -hmm. from uh, they actually came from Northern Iraq, from Kurdistan, even Syria by way of refugee camps. But there's so many things you, you do. Um, when, when you do that kind of work, we were living in community. So you get a double dose of things. You get community living. I mean, you're eating with the same people twice a day. We had that experience again just a few months ago in El Paso. We got to El Paso and immediately we're thrown in with a lot of people. People, there's a shortage of helpers, people to help, and there's an abundance of people who needed help. And so you're helping the people who need help, plus you're helping the people who are trying to help the other people. And that's about as good as it gets in this life. I sometimes think pastors have it easy because they're theoretically... <laughs> <laughs> their their thing is helping other people and then they also have the 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 advantage of working with others they're not a it's not the lone ranger they're working with others and even in in AA I had the experience over 10 years of many times it wasn't me just helping some guy one-on-one -on -one, although there was some of that but it's when there's two or three or four of us or even the whole group who are participating in helping somebody and um that's just um, when, you're, when you're raising a family and when you're working, you, your time is so diluted that it's hard to focus on, uh, on stuff. But when you're not working and you're, quote, retired uh, or you're, if you're fortunate enough to have a job, I, I think the social workers, pastors, um, teachers, school teachers, are very fortunate because the essence of their job is helping people. Yeah. Whereas people who deal in, and now I'm thinking about essentials and non-essentials, you know, yeah, dealing with non-essentials, thinking here we are in a big hurry to get back to, so we can do non-essential things. And I understand it, but uh, it's kind of, it's tough too. To, uh, I, you know, I know how unsatisfying in some ways non-essentials are, but then you got to eat, you got to work, you got to provide, you know, yeah. and um, yeah. I can't, I can't help but stop and think a little bit about like how um, there's such a deep internal desire we all have for community, like your desire when you were a part of a cult or when you were serving in Israel, Palestine, like what, what you seem to have loved the most about that was being able to do life with people and to be in community to help others and to be helped, um, to just share meals together, right? And so there's that, there's that deep desire we all have to like find community, which ultimately is like, 
is the most helpful thing when going through temptations and trials to know that you're not alone, to know that you have a support system, to know that um, in isolation, you, it can feel so crippling and it's so much easier to give in the temptation, like sitting alone and drinking at night, right? And no one even ever knows or questions that because you were very isolated. So um, yeah, I think it's, the idea of community is interesting. I do have one more question for you. Um, and it's a really big one, and it's it's not on your uh, not on your pre-prepared list of questions. And that is, Lewis, how long have you gone without a haircut? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, it's uh, it's funny because I I got one pretty close uh, to March fifteenth, but it was maybe less than two weeks away from March fifteenth. Okay. And um, so you're, you're going to you're like you're going to have to donate your hair to Locks of Love or something by the end of this is what you're telling me. I, I don't know. You know, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. That's, that's one of the least of my things. Issues. Yeah. Well, Lewis, I really appreciate you being willing to, to share your story with us and um, and just being able to be vulnerable and honest about how like what you said in the beginning, what are trials and temptations? They are life. Like we all go through them. Um, none of us are absent of it. And so trials and temptations are just the normal seed. So, um, but what's not normal is people's willingness to always share openly and frankly and vulnerably about those things. So thank you for, for sharing those with us. I think that um, it gives us all hope and encouragement to, to continue to resist the temptations and lean into the beauty of community um, when we're going through temptations and trials. So thank you again for sharing. Sure. Um, we love you and I well, cannot just, wait. Time's not, time's not up. I'm just getting warmed up, man. I know you are great. <laughs> <to preach. laughs> uh, I can't wait to see you again in person. Yeah. But for now, thanks for joining us tonight, Lewis. Sure. Okay, yeah. bye for now. Okay, you bet. Bye-bye.